Как работать с информацией? How to work with information, how to select and analyze it, how to incorporate it into our practices, how to use it in our work, in our leisure time and, on the other hand, how to observe information hygiene. That's what I'd like to talk about now. I'm going to divide this conversation into several parts. I'll start with a little preface. We live in a time when it seems that information is getting closer to us. I do a lot of lecturing, a lot of people's studies and a lot of us 21st century people have this prejudice against past eras. Well, they were these people of the 19th, 18th, 15th centuries less informed. Once there were no daily newspapers, once there was no radio, once there was no television, once there was no internet, once there was no electronic media. How could these people know anything about the world? It seems to us that we have a boundless field of information in front of us, that we can reach any point, any knowledge, any analytics with one or two clicks and quickly incorporate it into our practices, quickly connect it to our professional tasks and life tasks in general. Is that so? I always say that's a very serious mistake, because often, as I meet both students and mature people, often I see that it's increasingly difficult for people to make even a simple click, to go to, I don't know, some realm of information, to find some relevant source, because in order to search, you have to know what to look for. Before you can find any article or book, you need to know where to find it. But even if you found it, how do you work with it? Is this book or article a good book or article? Isn't this information false or propaganda? And it turns out that we, people, live in some amazing information noise and on average we are not only superior, but in many respects inferior to people of the 20th, 19th, 18th centuries. Think back to movies you watched as a child or watch now, like Sherlock reading the Times, some newspaper, who it's addressed to, how these are those characters go through thick newspapers in the morning and discuss them in clubs or in the evening or in the morning over tea, coffee, over wine, over whiskey or just over friendly conversation. These people are informed, these people have done a lot of things in the past. But what our generation will do is the big question. But this lyric I would now like to move on to practical instructions. So, first of all, we need to ask ourselves, why do we need information? What's our goal? If we want to access any information, we want to know what is going on in the world or happening in our areas of expertise. The first thing you need to do is to be clear about your goal. Why it's important. Because, for example, one of these financiers and coaches is famous, he is from Switzerland himself, but he received a philosophical education, Dobelli. He has these three books on critical thinking, practical, important practical steps of some kind. Here's Dobelli, and there it's all made of these little tiny little articles, little texts, little essays. Here in one essay he says, I often encounter people who spend many hours reading, searching, mastering information they don't need at all. And once, he says, I had a meeting with a group of business people, and I asked them, what percentage of the information you consume do you usefully apply to your work? And it turned out to be only a few percent. I'm not talking about life practices and so on. And more often than not, modern man lives in some, some paradoxical situation. On the one hand, I hear more and more often that modern man has no time to read. We don't have time. No time for books, no time for magazines, you know, no. There's no time to write. They tell me to, keep a diary, take some notes, some musings. We don't have time, we're very busy people, no reading, no writing, no time. But at the same time we read for hours, at the same time we write for hours in Viber, in Telegram, in Messenger, in email just some business stuff. Modern man is constantly writing, constantly working his fingers, constantly flipping through his newsfeed. And when people come to my workshops and sit in chairs, on the couch, I also see that people can't get away from their smartphones. They're constantly flipping through the newsfeed. Here is a formulation of the first paradox. A modern person, and an active one at that, who considers himself, I don't know, rational, active, says that he doesn't have time to read and write. At the same time, he spends several hours a day on chaotic, unsystematic, partly useless wandering through the vastness of electronic, not even media, but some garbage. 
And that's the disease, that's the diagnosis that many psychologists and cognitive scientists are making today. It's called, I won't abbreviate it so as not to call any foreign words, it's fear of missing something important. It's the fear of losing something important. We are connected to the streams. We feel like if we don't look at our smartphone or tablet in 20 minutes, something important will happen in the world that will affect us, our loved ones, and the world. Nothing happens when you do that. Not yesterday, not today, not tomorrow. People who seek information don't get the epical knowledge they expect. It's a disease. We are chained to these streams, we sit on these streams. And here we come to several important issues with which we must be more or less familiar in order to use them in our daily practices. 1. I will be so in the form of a thesis statement, expounding the thesis and giving examples. Thesis statement, thesis disclosure, example, first thesis, much of what is called information and what we find on social media, in general and on the internet, is not information. More often than not, it is rumor, speculation, conjecture of some sort, fantasy, spotlighting of some sort that creates the appearance of reality. Therefore, most of what we call information is not information. And so if we skip it, if we don't let it in, if we pass it by, we don't lose anything at all. That's a first. Second, even what's called media as traditional media is sometimes called mainstream media, or solid press, or new media, or social media, what's called social media, new media. Even what is called informing in these spheres and what are called media do not always inform, and most often do not inform at all. How do you figure that out? How do you distinguish false information from true information? And how do we find that information that makes us more knowledgeable and more, what, equipped in our practices? I want to draw attention here to the fact that simultaneously with our captivation by these flows, our attachment to what is happening in the information environment, manipulative practices and the influence of very thoughtful, very advanced groups of people, who are trying to influence minds, influence masses, influence large groups of people, are naturally increasing. When I lecture on the theory and practice of propaganda, I point out four important pillars of manipulation and propaganda in the realm of information, in the realm of knowledge acquisition. The first of these is fragmentation. We're given slices on social media and all these quasi-media outlets. Knowledge and information is fragmented. And when it is presented in the form of fragments, and chaotic fragments at that, we have absolute chaos, absolute mush in our consciousness. Let's do an experiment. Take any big electronic media, the so-called electronic newspapers that you have on your smartphones that you're used to, and look at the message. There's often a streak, a message like this. Watch the message for, say, 20 to 30 minutes, maybe an hour. You'll see a jumble of totally bizarre messages in there. I don't know, Macron is going to China. A drunken mother threw her infant out of a window. Something was said about football player so and so. Produced so many tons of something. There will be frost tomorrow. Then there's information about Trump, for example. Then information about a military conflict somewhere in the world. And then again completely empty mundane information about some fights, some sharp fried facts that we don't need at all. Who beat who, who killed who, who insulted who. Which pop star has said everything she thinks about another pop star? It's accompanied by things like this. Here's a side note. Lately, the last year or two this has become very common. I don't know, their Petrov, conventional surname Petrov, spoke harshly about Ivanov's words. Are there, I don't know, Peterson reacted harshly to Ivanson's words to some. That's one tough put down, answered tough. I don't want to use such profanity right now. It is often accompanied by, it fills the airwaves. 
And so in such fragmentation, an important event is simply lost. It would seem that these electronic newspapers or quasi-newspapers inform us about something. But our attention can't dwell on what important things happen during the day. Because along with a drunken mother or about one type's harsh statement about another, something most important is lost. And on the other hand, a lot of important things and events simply do not get into these feeds, because they are created, attention, for a very average consumer, who is not used to hold attention not used to analyze, not used to stop his attention on these or those events. So we need very quick turnover and we need a lot of empty but so peppered with hot, affecting our emotions, messages thrown in. That's the first point, that is, fragmentation. Also related to fragmentation is the fact that social media and social networks do not operate on the principle of informing and presenting news, but on the principle that news becomes a commodity. And any loudly presented news, any, let's say, sensational or, I would say, allergic, or, if you will allow me to look for words here, synonymously, I would even say scandalous or generally at the level of some kind of panic, information, it immediately attracts attention, immediately hundreds of people arise, who like it, begin to inform. And this is the kind of news, a commodity, presented sensationally, panically, excitedly, emotionally, that attracts hundreds and hundreds, thousands and thousands of people. You and I want to learn something about the events of the day, we want to analyze something. But all the threads, all the gawkers, all the people, let's say, inadequate or semi-adequate, rush into a discussion of who responded harshly to whom, who behaved this way or that way, and we will all discuss it. Therefore, fragmentation, enhanced by the pressure on emotions, with an increase in the degree of scandalousness, is a must. That's how the hard, yellow, excuse me, press used to work, but now it's generally been put on such a, you know, mass conveyor belt. The second principle of how propaganda works and manipulates is to strip events or fact of context. This is called more scientifically decontextualization. We're not just given a fragment that's ripped out, but taken out of some context, and if it's decontextualized, we don't understand what's going on at all. There's something going on somewhere by the Kiev Petrovsk laboratory, there's something going on somewhere in Tibet, somewhere else in the United States, but we don't know how the judicial system works, what cases Trump can be indicted on, that one way or the other, generally what the political system is in a particular country. Most often in such electronic media, the context does not exist and it is difficult for us to reconstruct it, and without reconstructing the context, even if the news reaches us, we do not understand its meaning. It's decontextualization. And another important point is to give a fact or event a new context, what the propagandist needs, what the manipulator needs. This is called in literature recontextualization, giving a new context to an event, when, for example, the indignation of a group of people can be given, for example, the character of a rebellion, a speech against the authorities or some revolutionary and progressive movement. Here's something going on in the street, burned a lot of cars, resisted the police, that's a slice of the facts. But we've had one context removed and another context pulled up and included in the coverage of this event. And the fact shown out as revolution or riot, as a disturbance of public order or a legitimate demand for one's rights. It all depends on how the media or a particular expert, political scientist or commentator contextualizes the event. So, of course, one last point before we move on to, and what do we, how do we combat this, how do we seek information, work with information. Another point has to do with the fact that most facts are not facts, but factual statements. Recall the previous conversation, actually, we are not dealing with facts, but with estimates. And if you want to know a brief description of propaganda, it would sound like this, in four points. Propaganda is assessments instead of facts, fragmentation, decontextualization and recontextualization. And powerful systems and people who know how to pitch it work on that. Even the very selection in the feed of news, facts, snippets, is also a definite choice. When you say, we have a lot, we can look for a lot of information. Where will you look? What are the main criteria you'll be looking for? Here's the question. You'll just get lost in this sea. There will be a few questions that will arise, which we must now move into. So where do you look for information? How do you test it? Which sources of information can be trusted, which ones can't? 
And how do we analyze this information? I'm moving on to the positive part of our conversation. To begin with, there is no media that simply presents certain facts as something neutral. Here some of you may say, give us just the facts, we don't need estimates, give us sets of facts. Have you considered the fact that presenting the bare fact, pure fact, may not tell you anything at all? Every fact needs some meaning, some context after all. By itself, it doesn't say anything. That's when we demand just the facts. We see that in principle even the way we describe a fact can already conceal this or that assessment. In propaganda workshops, we often looked at such brief reports, newspaper or magazine. For example, we're dealing with one sentence that describes, let's say, some congress of, I don't know, a populist party in Germany, the AFD. And it's the liberal media, the classic German media. It cannot simply say that on such and such a day there was a meeting of this party or a meeting or some, I don't know, conference, and that such and such issues were and were discussed. It's never talked about like that. I can always say it's a radical populist or right-wing party that held its convention, but look for a harsher, more pejorative word. And there have been a number of radical and populist assertions made there. It would also seem to be a fact, a party gathered, discussing something. But the journalist or this publication supplies this event with a number of, let's say, adjective epithets, metaphors, which always color this fact in one or another tone, in one or another color, in one or another shade. And this distribution of labels, that is now in this case, what, for example, is happening in the Petrusk Lavra, for example, such popes speak there, it means that they behave scandalously. That's the scandalous, there's, I don't know, some asses like that. I don't want to talk now because I think the conversation, you can watch this conversation six months or a year from now and what I'm talking about now will just lose its meaning and be forgotten. In this case, you take any such solid newspaper in your group and see how the fact is described, with what, here's the main test, with what adjectives, with what metaphors, with what intonation the fact is presented. So you'll learn to distinguish between a fact and a fact. And so, when we talk about the following, well, give us only facts, don't give us evaluations, we should realize that all modern media, especially the solid media, mainstream media, have some kind of position. And most of the media, let's say, depending on the countries, can be either left liberal, well, let's say, with a very strong left-wing bias, or, at best, so centrist liberal. What we call radical left-wing or radical right-wing is practically marginalized media. And the mainstream media in America, France, Europe, it's so, closer to the center, left-right. So we have to realize, even if the media is solid, we have to be able to work with the information filed there and compare it to something. And here I can make a few recommendations. For example, how I work with information. First of all, why is it important to choose a particular newspaper? Well, preferably a paper version, if not, you can subscribe, subscribe to the electronic version of a reputable newspaper. Try to refuse this kind of free mass feeding of information. These are the quasi-media that our smartphones are filled with that more often than not don't deserve any attention. It's just a waste of time. Subscribe to some newspapers, it could be, well, I don't know, it could be if you compare the left. If it's Britain, it could be the Guardian, it could be the Guardian, it could be the Times, it could be the New York Times, if we're talking about American newspapers or the Washington Post, but they're very much also engaged today. It could be Figaro or Le Mans. Again, I'm pointing out the different directions of France. It could be Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung, Süddeutsch Zeitung, these are daily newspapers, are Die Zeit a weekly newspaper that comes out on Thursdays. But you should always choose two newspapers, preferably of different leanings, for example, centrist and liberal and left liberal, or, let's say, moderately left-wing or moderately right-wing, so that you have some kind of view, some kind of optics. Why else is it important to pay attention to such solid media? Because there the selection of facts is not based on the principle of fried news, which are free of charge dropped on the average person, and there are still working experts who try to present events in the world of some coherent picture. And there's always politics, finance, economics, culture, science, and there are, say, interviews with all sorts of deep people in a thick daily newspaper. I like the German press, for example, 
very much, but I also watch a bit of British, American press, but in this case never electronic, chaotic, chaotic streams of information will replace these optics with solid newspapers with professionals. Another point, if you want to totally briefly browse, you don't have time for example, your goal is different, just to know what's going on in the world. You don't have time to read these papers every day. You can pay attention to the weeklies. Weeklies like The Economist, for example. The advantage of them is that they always start with this brief, the main event of the week. In a small paragraph, highlighted always in bold, where it happens, and these news stories are filed. Here, politics news comes first, then business news. You see, page of the week politics, page of the week business. So you get this kind of informational summary, there and there happened, and it's close to the actual description. Although it is, let's say, such a liberal, sometimes left liberal direction. But at least you're given a very brief description of certain events. And then in the magazine itself you get some in-depth articles. Here, for example, is an option like this. Or what I also read weekly, the German Spiegel. It is such a very, though liberal, too liberal, but a versatile magazine, where there are polemics, where there are different positions, and also given the main events in the week, and interviews with people, say, of the week, interviews with scientists, politicians, businessmen, artists. So you have, for example, two such sources, English and German. You can subscribe to them in an electronic version so you don't get aggravated from your shelf, your apartment. I too live with books, magazines, it's my profession, but you can keep it all electronic. Of course, it is more pleasant to read it in paper form, underline markers, write what I do, but, nevertheless, still not everyone is ready to constantly clutter the number of magazines and newspapers in their apartment. I, when I read newspapers, I lead in parallel. I have a diary, like a political diary, some important events. Sometimes I write something on my Patreon channel. Sometimes I talk about something on my YouTube channel, but I have a journal, and I make clippings, and I always organize the clippings into topics. When I read the newspaper, in the paper version, I actively use markers. I do captioning, because articles in foreign languages I have to write something in my native language in the abstract sometimes. That leaves me with the major magazines, weeklies and clippings, interviews, some important events, some important analysis. If I have to speak or prepare a workshop or write an article or a book, I have everything laid out in certain, let's say, spheres, written down, I have the main thesis. I can develop this later either in speaking or when I write a text. Then there are magazines that come out quarterly or bi-monthly rather than weekly. These magazines are also advised to you if you are interested in political analysis. One of the magazines I use, for example, is Foreign Affairs. There are quite a few such magazines, but I chose this one because, after all, America continues to play an important role in world life. This journal publishes the world's most renowned political scientists and economists from the world's best universities. That's not to say that there are always good articles. That doesn't mean that quality is guaranteed. It just means you have a cross-section of the major names, major concepts, and ways of presenting major topics in such a solid publication that you can always subscribe to as well. This magazine is published twice a month. So you might have six of these magazines on a shelf every year, or in your library, or in your office, and so on. So it turns out that two issues a month is six magazines on your shelf and so on. We now turn to another source of information. Okay, did I do the math right? Let's check my math now. See, I got a little carried away with the content. So, two, two, two. That works out. Yeah, a little bit more. Well, never mind, do the math. It happens a lot. Here you see an example of this switching of the brain. When the brain is keen in one direction, it therefore sags in another. At any rate, you will have several magazines for the year. Now. I'd like to still point out the materials that come out every year or semi-annually. See how interesting my construction is. We have daily newspapers. Those who are not interested in current daily analytics can buy weeklies. The weeklies, here Spiegel from Economist, I gave you an example, there are many others, but I emphasized these. Then there are the ones like foreign affairs, they come out every two months. And then we have an even more narrowed picture. And finally, once every six months or once a year, these reviews come out very important, final reviews. I highly recommend it. For example, Le Monde Diplomatique produces atlases of globalization like this. 
Here, for example, are the last two, as you can see. And they are structured to have exactly what you need here, whether you're a politician, a businessman, or just an educated mature citizen. There's a lot of infographics, different kinds of WhatsApp articles, very important maps. You see, here's the Instagram. This is how I work. I emphasize, sometimes I write. That's first hand. It's not like you'll have to search through a vast sea of information on the internet. It's all put together by experts. It's all tested. There is always a guarantee here that it's government organizations or certain research institutions that guarantee the results, their data, the results of their research. Again, doesn't mean we should trust them all the time. But the other, other sources we don't have. The Thus, we move from daily newspapers to weeklies, then to the once a month or once a quarter magazines. And every six months to a year these infographics, these atlases, these summarizing compilations, very important. And in this way you get very good tools in your daily work. But again, going back to the beginning of our conversation, you need to ask yourself what your goal is. For example, if you are a businessman, if you are a cultural worker, if you are a person who is more engaged in creativity, you are less interested in politics or business, then you can limit yourself to a weekly or look once a month at some important data, infographics and figures. If you want to actively understand what is going on, and I believe that a citizen of his country should be active, mature, reasoning, he should analyze what is going on, then build for yourself a certain algorithm of reading daily sources like this. Again, don't let the figure of an hour a day, for example, scare you. For in fact, I emphasize, man passively, without noticing it, does not swim out of informational, quasi-informational flows for hours. So one way or another you're still reading. But, if you know you have reliable information, here are these two newspapers, here is this weekly or two weeklies, you will be less tempted to swim for hours every day in this boundless sea. That's what information hygiene is all about. That is, I can formulate it in a few important theses. One. Don't devote a minute of your precious time to second-rate, unverified, questionable information. The benefits will be nil, the loss of time will be enormous, the frustration will be enormous. Second thesis. Look only for trusted sources, where experts work where data is always verified in one way or another. But it's important that your sources are from different camps so you can see how this illuminates the right and left camps. Or, say, the left and centrist camp. Then you'll have the optics you need. That's the second rule. Trust only good information. Third, structure your day so that you are clear on how much time you spend processing information today, tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, throughout the week. This will keep you from being tempted to constantly scour news feeds. I assure you, you won't find anything there. There will only be distant, unprofessional, muddy paraphrases of the sources I recommend to you. It's been tried and tested over the years. When some pseudo-experts, pseudo-bloggers with hundreds of thousands show up, they paraphrase, rehash what is in the information I pointed out to you. And then there's the attention to the note B in Latin. This is also the fourth important element of information hygiene. Instead of taking from old hands and wasting time listening for hours on YouTube to questionable persons, questionable types, always go to the original source. It saves you time, improves the quality of your awareness and the quality of your analytics. After all, I partially intersect with that environment in one way or another. And I see, for example, here's this talking head going into interviews, talking to different venues, it could be five to six hours during the day. It's his life, it's his bread, he says, he says, he says, he says. The question I have as a researcher is, when does he read the sources I mention? Where does he get his information? How can he reason about everything? And now bloggers reason about everything, economics, politics, culture, China, the US, South Africa war, peace and everything, geopolitics. But where he gets his information, he's always talking to someone. If I know from myself it's an hour a day at least, but it usually takes me somewhere around two hours on average a day since it's part of my classes as well. So anything these people can say, doubtful, as all paraphrases, some pathetic shadows or, let's say, a very unprofessional retelling, interpretation of what is given in certain sources.
Of course, if the person is from some important milieu, an insider for example, it's not only reading texts, but it's also conversations. But let's put it this way, put your hand on your heart, are there a lot of insiders or are there a lot of journalists or bloggers or analysts who meet with representatives of their senate or representatives of some business communities on a daily basis? It doesn't happen very often, does it? And there aren't many people like that. We naturally get most of our information from magazines, newspapers, and interviews, which we learn to analyze. One more point. Here I was talking about bloggers, false bloggers, talking heads. That doesn't mean we shouldn't use YouTube. I use it all the time. But, again, that's your experience. After you've worked the press the way I recommend, Make demands for yourself on the experts you listen to. How structured is their speech? How much of an argument do they make? How much of his speech is invested in this or that content? How consistent is he? If he analyzes this or that, let's say, sphere, to what extent it is coherent, consistent with the opinions of experts from the best centers, let's say, university, research world. Check. If you can find people like that, it's very valuable and also refer to them periodically, every two days, every three days for their analytics. Reach out to get information from them. But more often than not, you can sign up. And in addition to these informational tools that I mentioned, you can subscribe to certain first-level analysts. I do that, too. And always these people have columns in major magazines and newspapers, and you can subscribe to their blog. Blog at the New York Times, blog at The Economist. And you will constantly receive his or her analytics, small texts of reasoning on this or that topic. You will have such a pool and such a, let's say, group of analysts, but the best ones that will allow you to reconstruct the picture, to reconstruct what's going on. Well, I'd like to end with one more source that I use actively, and that is books. Books of various genres. I think some of you have watched my videos on how to read, how to build self-education, how to choose books. It should be kept in mind that today we find more truth and more objectivity not in magazines and newspapers, but in books. There are books coming out in Europe and America that are very relevant, very poignant. More often than not, they even in the newspaper version, the version, say, of an article would not even be allowed to be published often. Sometimes only we know about them from some reviews. Because it's believed that the book will probably be read by one in a hundred. That books take a long time to read, that people have learned to read books. Therefore, the publication of such books is treated more or less tolerantly. And we can find in bookstores from Poland through Germany, France, Italy, all the way to Britain and America books not only on history, philosophy, economics, some studies, historical or studies of some important events, but also books on current topics. I use them extensively. For example, some important event or some milestone or some actual chain of events has occurred. Literally two or three months later, more often than not six months later some book on the subject comes out. On the political theme, on the economic theme, on the social theme, on the sociopolitical theme. And the book always has the upper hand. That's for those who don't want to read the media at all and who value their creative time so much, being an artist or an actor or a musician and not being friends with the media at all, they can buy books like this. Because the authors of these books base their research, their books on a large body of literature. And they are that GPS for you. They, these authors, allow you, by referring to YouTube, to newspapers, to magazines, to other books, to politicians' speeches, to this or that action of politicians or economists or businessmen or whoever, they allow you to put together a picture. And in this book, Less engaged than a magazine or newspaper, you find besides a presentation of ideas with arguments, not taken out of context, not decontextualized, but presented sequentially, from section to section, backed up by lots of information, lots of references, you get a happy combination of many factors. And if you yourself don't want to buy such a book for your house, for example, you have an office or a company or some group, some club, you can create such a library. 
the library of your club or your company or some community and check out similar books in different languages. I really advise you, those who read well in one language or another, you can also to these friends or colleagues of yours to ask them or give them assignments or specifically get together once a week or once a month for such discussions of such literature. It's very useful. Then, for example, one person talks about research in one field, another in another, don't forget that besides reading, discussion, dialogue, communication, live, the second, if not the most important, first source of our information and our information hygiene. When we can have a conversation with a person, ask them questions, clarify and tell them something ourselves. You see, reading and socializing, newspapers, magazines, books and the live interaction of personalities, this is the main condition for our awareness, our analytics and our information hygiene. So I'm generalizing. So. Information hygiene consists in not reading a huge amount of secondary, unprofessional, contentless quasi-literature or quasi-materials, but rather betting on proven, solid, professional sources of information. 1. Second. We plan our day and week in such a way that we align ourselves with the information we receive from these sources. It is also desirable to discuss it with people close in spirit, in thinking, in lifestyle. Third, you can dose this solid information in a variety of ways. Daily, every two months, every six months or reading some books, monographs. And one more important point, you should always share your thoughts, your reflections with other people. If you have a club, or have a community, or have a group of like-minded people, you need to have ideas, thoughts, observations circulating in your circle. It encourages thought, it encourages analysis, it strengthens us, because communication is recognized to strengthen each other, to strengthen like-minded interlocutors. Remember that everything in our civilization originated in circles of like-minded people, in small groups, in circles where they learned, discussed and created something together. I think enough has been said about this topic. If the need arises, we can do some workshops, where we can use specific examples, studying some specific sources of information and feeding of active events, we can then in this workshop try to learn how to do it. In this conversation I tried to give some general theses and give you practical recommendations.